Welcome to the Nautilus Files. Ah yes, Irving Bailiff, the renaissance man of the severed floor. I think it's about time I did an analysis of Irving, the consummate, sophisticated, and eldest member of the MDR department. Irving has garnered a fair amount of favor with the fans of the show, and rightly so. His genteel nature coupled with his preoccupation for Lumen lore make him a very interesting character to say the least. It is later on in his story though, when his any experiences love for the first time seemingly, this character becomes more fully realized and finds his personal conflict and impetus to grow as a person. Let's take a deeper look into Irving and see what we know and what we can learn from his story so far. But before we begin, this video, as you might have guessed, is wrapped in spoilers and sautéed in a theory sauce served on a bed of details from season one. Yes, I'm recording while I'm hungry again. If you haven't already caught up on season one, you might want to head back to the main floor and handle that. You can take the elevator or the stairs, your choice. Just be sure to come back when you're ready. Now that we're all settled in, bon appetit. So, Irving, what is there to say about it? I think it's safe to say that Irving is a man that cares about how he is perceived, and that informs how we are meant to receive him as a character early in the season. Irving often remarks about being the eldest member of MDR, and feels that this distinction obligates him to be an example to the rest of the department. Irving enters his first scene repeating one of Petey's lines. Hi kids, what's for dinner? God damn it, Irv, we warned you. About the greeting, you were kidding. Exhibiting a sense of humor you might characterize as dry wit. Irving also has high regard for authority, and we can see this in the way that he responds to Milchik when he enters the room or gives direction. We also witness this when he's fussing with Dylan about the rules, while reciting lines from the handbook. These make for some funny moments since these two make a perfect odd couple, having completely different points of view on just about everything. While Irving does it for Lumen, Dylan is just trying to get that next waffle party. Irving has Kier in his blood, and he expects that everyone else at MDR should too. But we know Dylan, he's not about that life. Irving becomes a nag when he thinks that others are not following the rules or he suspects that they don't share the same level of reverence for Lumen that he does. He tries his best to control his rage when Mark has the audacity to sit on Kier's bed in the perpetuity wing scene. One thing you can say about Irving is that even though he's constantly nagging others, it all comes from a good place. Irving sincerely apologized to Mark and the group when he sees how upset Mark is for being chewed out by Kobol because of his ill-advised visits to see Bert and OND. When Dylan figures out that Irving and Bert are a thing, he's not too happy about it, out of concern for Irving's safety. And you can see Irving's reaction when Dylan expresses his disapproval. You can see he's legitimately disappointed in himself. I like this scene because it shows that even though these two are always at each other's throats, they both do care about the other. And of course, there's the entire reason why we visit the Perpetuity Wing, and this is because Irving is concerned about Heli's difficulties in adjusting to any life. So they do this hoping to inspire her. And well, we all know how that turned out. Okay, so I don't think we can go any further without discussing Irving's inky hallucinations. On more than one occasion, Irving experiences a waking nightmare involving black ooze dripping out of every crevice and corner of his cubicle. Naturally, he's terrified by this because either he nor the audience understand what's going on. It's not until the end of the season that we get confirmation that this black ooze is in fact black paint. There are various theories regarding this, but the prevailing one is that Audi Irving is making an attempt to reach any Irving through their shared subconscious. We see Audi Irving painting the hallway leading to the testing floor over and over again in his apartment, all the while chugging coffee and listening to Motorhead's Ace of Spades late into the night. Repeatedly painting the scene is supposedly done to entrench the image in his subconscious, while the coffee ensures that Irving shows up to work sleepy. Sleep and dreams are believed to allow the subconscious to connect with the conscious mind more directly. And this is probably why Irv sees the paint and interprets it as ooze on the inside of Lumen. I wanted to establish this point before we got more into Irving's Audi, but not before we talk about one other aspect of Irv's character, and that's his love life. While waiting for an appointment in the wellness room, Irv bumps into Bert, the head of the optics and design department. The two hit it off while discussing the paintings that are posted around the floor that Bert is apparently responsible for. It doesn't take long before romantic feelings begin to set in and Irving finds himself facing a major conflict. Irving knows that relationships are forbidden, but he is unable to tamp down his feelings for Bert. 
That moment where Bert touches his hand, Irving basks in it. Then his quote unquote better judgment kicks in and this causes him to run. This appears to be a running theme with a few of the characters. The idea that love can defy and transcend external societal control, severance respectively. Without getting too far off course, this theme is in play with Mark and Gemma as well as Dylan and his son. You could even argue that it is true for Kobel and Charlotte. The question is posed, will love triumph over severance? This looms large and I think the series aims to answer that question for us by the time it's all said and done. From this point out, Irving breaks the rules repeatedly, reading Rickon's contrabands, sneaking off for visits to Bert and even walking in on Bert's retirement party while Milchik is still there. Irving is so distraught by Bert's premature exit that he tears into Milchik over it. This is completely out of character, signaling to us the audience that Irving is changing. Now Lumen probably forced Bert to retire because they became aware of what was going on between the two men. And this creates yet another question. Why is Lumen so afraid of letting the departments fraternize? What do they think is going to happen? I suspect they fear the workers uniting, working together to figure things out, or perhaps even an uprising, but that's a topic for another video. Regardless, it's at this moment in the story that Irving wakes up and begins to recognize the nature of his cage. Recall when Koble quotes Kier as saying, The surest way to tame a prisoner is to let him believe he's free. This is a Kier quote for everything. Irving no longer believes. He sees his condition for what it is and has no qualms about what needs to be done next. Let's burn this place to the ground. I couldn't have said it better myself. In the final episode of season one, we are hit with a massive amount of info about Irving in a very short span of time. Severance writers are crafty AF, so while we do get some answers, they come packaged with even bigger questions. How does Audi Irving know about the testing floor? We find out that Irving is involved in some kind of investigation into the severed people at Lumen, or Lumen itself, but we're never given definitive answers as to what his goals and intentions are. Based on what we do see, his cut out articles and scribbled notes, he believes Lumen has done some wrong and, and it appears he's trying to do something about that. Now we are told at one point that there are people who are working against Lumen. Assuming Ragabi to be one of those people, is it possible that Irving is also in cahoots? Or is he completely on his own? Or maybe working in some official capacity? So many questions, but we're gonna have to wait. It is interesting to note that we are shown that Irving's father served in the military, Navy which is a point some have taken to mean that his father may have also been severed. That could be really interesting. It could be the reason why he's doing what he's doing in the first place. The most interesting thing about Irving's final scenes is what he chooses to do with the brief time he has outside. He wanted more than anything to find the person that he loves, and once he got that address, his only purpose in life was finding Bert's house. When he finally does find Bert's house, he's faced with the fact that Bert has someone on the outside and appears to be pretty happy. Still, he decides he needs to talk to Bert, knowing that this might be the last chance he has to say anything at all to him. He goes for it banging on the door with the desperate hope that he still has time. We never find out if he gets to talk to Bert as an innie, which makes for a great cliffhanger. A frustrating one, but a good one nonetheless. Irving Bailiff starts out as a character that I believed was primarily meant to be there for comedy, but much like Dylan, by the end of the season, I've become deeply invested in this character and his outcome. While his perspective goes through a marked change, he maintains a strong sense of conviction and willingness to act on those convictions when the opportunity presents, which I find to be a very admirable trait. Here's to Irving finding a happy ending. That wraps up another character analysis video. I hope you enjoyed it. What are your thoughts on Irving as a character? Let me know in the comments and let's talk about it. If you like this video, you know what to do. And until next time, off you go.